Okay, let's uh, get going. So thank you everyone today for coming to FMC's Flash webinar, Raise Money and Build Community with Engaging Online Fundraising. We're going to be going over a variety of techniques and strategies for online fundraising, including hosting effective and engaging online events. Um, before we get started, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping notes. First of all, uh, this webinar is being recorded and we'll be sending out the recording at the end. We're also live broadcasting on Facebook. So if you get disconnected for any reason or have trouble with Zoom for any re reason, you can always go over to FMC's Facebook page and watch it there. We'll also be sending out any documents, resources that we mentioned uh, at the end of this webinar through an email to everyone who registered. Um, so if you miss, once again, if you miss anything or if you are looking for any links, you will be able to get it through that email. If you have any questions during the first part of the presentation, um, we're not gonna be really taking questions until the end, but feel free to dot any questions or thoughts you have down in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom um, app, you should have a button that says Q&A. You can put your question there. You can note a particular panel, panelist that you want to answer it uh, there and we'll be able to either type an answer to you or we'll get to your question at the end during the live Q&A portion. So my name is Stephanie Fenty. Uh, you probably should have started with that. I am, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the manager of operations and strategic engagement at the Farmers Market Coalition. On the call today, we also have Caroline Fiore from FarmAid, as well as Nora Shivanik, from who's the deputy director at Texas Farmers Market. Uh, as for me, I'm from the Farmers Market Coalition, which is a national organization dedicated to strengthening farmers markets for the benefit of farmers, consumers, and communities. I also have Ben Feldman and Hannah Fuller from FMC on the call with us. Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment before we start to tell you a bit about National Farmers Market Week. Every year we celebrate National Farmers Market Week the first full week of August. And as you may notice, that's coming up very quickly. Next week uh, is the start of it. We, FMC offers a variety of resources, templates in our toolkit for farmers market operators. Um, it's a great opportunity for market operators to participate in the campaign, um, which is our biggest celebration of the year and get a lot of additional eyes on their market and support for farmers markets in general. As we've seen this year, markets obviously need that support because of the pandemic. There's additional costs, there's decreased revenue. And one way that it's very important to generate support for markets is through advocacy work. Um, this webinar came in kind of the perfect time because we have a call to action right now in regards to the current proposed COVID relief uh, bill in the Senate. So I'm gonna turn it over to our executive director, Ben Feldman, for just a few moments to talk a bit about that call to action and what we really hope all of you will call and ask for in addition, uh, for additions to the uh, relief bill. Thanks, Steph. Um, so just a little um, background on Monday, the Senate released um, their latest proposal for a, a coronavirus relief package after a long wait. Um, the House passed their package back in May. Um, the Senate package certainly falls considerably short in a number of areas. Uh, notably, the, for our work, the bill fails to support direct market farmers, farmers markets, and low-income shoppers. Um, the, the good news is there's still an opportunity to improve the bill. Um, there has been disagreement um, among uh, Republican leadership around uh, what the bill should include, and it seems unlikely that um, all of the Republicans will be supporting the bill. As a result, they'll need Democratic support, which means um, there's opportunity for negotiation, and that's even before it goes to the House where it will be negotiated further. But um, as you can see on the screen, um, there's a few things that we would like to see in that still included in that bill. Um, 
the important thing to keep in mind here is that while we, there is an opportunity, the window is now and it won't last um, past the end of this week. So this is really um, a call to action right now. Um, so we would ask you all to take a moment after you get off this call to speak to your senators, ask for the things that are on this list um, and help make sure that farmers markets farmers who sell at them and the shoppers who rely on them are included in the, the next coronavirus relief package. We'll follow up with this information um, in that email that we send out later today. Um, and so we greatly appreciate your support as we um, help make sure that farmers markets have uh, what they need in the next package. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, okay, so now I will turn it over to Caroline, who will talk a bit about pivoting to virtual events and some online fundraising strategies. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm really excited to be part of the call. We love the work of the Farmers Market Coalition and all of the markets that are involved in that work. So we're happy to be a part of this and to share some insights about online fundraising and virtual events that we hope are useful. So for those that don't know Farm Aid, um, we are a national nonprofit that works every day to build a vibrant family farm centered system of agriculture in America. We're best known for being a music festival. This is our 35th anniversary. The first festival was held in 1985 when Willie Nelson and Neil Young, um, who were inspired by a comment by Bob Dylan at Live Aid decided to host a big um, festival for family farmers. Um, and it was, it came together in about a month, I think maybe even shorter than that. Uh, and it raised almost $10 million, that one festival. So there were dozens and dozens of acts. Um, the show kicked off with Bon Jovi as the opener. So that can tell you kind of the lineup was pretty star-studded. And Willie, Neil, and John Mellencamp, who was also a founding member of Farm Aid, thought it would be a one day event to raise money and solve the problem that farmers are facing with credit and foreclosure issues. Um, and little did they know that the fundraising uh, hotline number that they had set up for the day of the show to take donations was actually receiving calls from farmers in crisis looking for support. So from that realization, uh, an organization was kind of born. And so we, Farm Aid quickly pivoted to not only have the festival every year to raise money um, to support its work, but also to help family farmers provide direct service and to support grantees across the country who are providing services to farmers every day. So I guess you could say that in-person events, um, especially like big live music festivals are part of Farm Aid's DNA, it's our origin story. And so when the pandemic struck in March, um, we were kind of at a loss of how to pivot to bring that farm aid experience to people in a virtual way. Um, not only is the festival our biggest fundraising platform each year, it's also the, the biggest day to raise awareness about the work that we do and about the great work that grantees do across the country and to bring farmer stories to the public. So thinking about how the pandemic might impact live events was something that um, was top of mind for us starting in March and still is every day as we consider plans for our festival this year, which typically happens in the fall. Oops, sorry. So um, the challenges of COVID-19 are being felt across all sectors and all, all types of organizations are feeling the impacts from it specifically nonprofits and community organizations and, and farmers markets. Farmers markets are not only providing um, a community space, but an essential service and good food to people that everyone relies on. And so the challenge of having a, to cancel in-person events, like to postpone your farmers market, to postpone a festival that raises money for the work that you do is a huge impact on this sector. And in March, we were kind of thinking about what the projection might be um, in charitable giving for nonprofit organizations and community organizations throughout 2020. And at first there was the initial projection of about a 10% decrease in charitable giving. And so that um, figure, I think it spooked a lot of people in nonprofit work that how do we ask for money in a time where it's expected to be scant and giving is expected to decline. Um, is it okay to ask for 
funds for your work in the middle of a pandemic. This is not something that any of us had really dealt with before, especially fundraising professionals. Um, and so we kind of thought about what we were going to do to support our farmers and ranchers in this time. Farmers and ranchers are essential workers. They're always on the front lines growing good food and, and bringing it to market. And the farmers markets are delivering it to the people. And so we thought that work wasn't going to be stopping. Our work can't stop because we're supporting these important folks. So we just decided to really shore up our online fundraising strategy around COVID-19 and supporting our essential family farmers and ranchers. And seeing as we are a music event and we were seeing concerts move virtually, um, we were able to tap our board, Willie Nelson, Neil Young, John Mellencamp and Dave Matthews to put together a concert event in about a, in a couple of weeks. It was almost reminiscent of the first Farm Aid where we threw together uh, At Home with Farm Aid which premiered on April 11th. Um, and our board, you know, tuned in from home. They, they shared some music performances with the audience um, from around the country and around the world. We had people tuning in. And we coordinated not only the music event across our, web, our webcast and our social media channels and YouTube, but we tried to make sure that that fundraising pitch, which was so central to making sure that we could do our work was at the heart of this event too. And so we had um, all participants talking about donating to Farm Aid. We had a text to donate number um, and the response was overwhelming. We did not know what to expect from folks tuning in for a one hour music special. And we're very fortunate in that we have these legendary artists that we can ask to do this for us, but we raised over $500,000 in 24 hours to support our family, our Farm Aid COVID-19 Farmer Resilience Initiative, where we deployed that money to support family farmers as emergency grants um, for household expenses and other needs during this time, as well as to support the organizations that are helping farmers navigate the pandemic and um, doing advocacy issues as well, um, similar to what Farmers Market Coalition is up to. So we were really pleased with the response to this virtual event. Um, it's not something we had done before, like I said, and it took a coordinated effort to make sure that we could get this fundraising appeal off the ground um, online and virtually. So one thing that I think is critical to know, um, I know we're all in different phases of fundraising. Um, sometimes, some organizations and markets on the call might not rely on fundraising for um, driving their efforts and others might rely solely on fundraising for driving their efforts. So no matter where you are in your fundraising journey, uh, it all starts with planning. And I know that National Farmers Market Week is coming up um, in just a few days. And so that's a perfect time. The, the ready-made materials and marketing um, materials that FNC has created for markets to take advantage of that week is almost like out of the box uh, marketing. So I think that National Farmers Market Week is not only just a great place to start, but it's a way to tell your story and to engage your vendors, um, partners, all kinds of folks that rely on the spaces that you provide through your market to help you with the campaign. So for example, with Farm Aid, when we did at home with Farm Aid and ran our online fundraising campaign around COVID-19, we relied not only on the artists who were very fortunate to have, I know not every organization can ask Willie Nelson to go on TV and sing a few songs, but not only Willie, but others that are engaged in our work that could spread the awareness about this online fundraising campaign and tap into their social media following or their email list. Um, we were surprised at how far it went. And I think when you start to engage your partners in your community, you'll be surprised too. I know um, Nora is going to talk about that as well as part of their campaign. But also engaging media, um, whether it's your local media, um, your own channels, the channels of maybe some influencers in your community, a way to just spread awareness about your campaign is critical. And foresight and planning about how you might do that is part of the whole game. And then in addition, creating content for all channels is something that you want to think about as you embark on this um, planning and how you might talk to each audience, whether it's your email list, your social media following, 
um, if you're going to have a fundraising aspect at your market, if it's up and running or your online, your online market, um, you want to make sure that it's tailor made to each platform and each audience that you're going to be reaching because um, you can't expect that everyone's going to see it if it's in one place. So Farm Aid, not only do we send out an email appeal, but we also send out mailers, we send out um, asks on social media. It's all on our website in a coordinated way where the look and feel is the same and people start to recognize that message. Um, like, okay, they are, this is, this is the focus right now for this market or this organization. And one thing that's maybe uncomfortable if you're just starting out with fundraising um, is making the ask and not only making the ask once, but making it often loud and clear. So in addition to coordinating that content, you're gonna wanna make sure your appeals, um, that, that the ask is central. So for me, when I, I've been in fundraising, I've worked at Farm Aid for 10 years and that skill just takes a while to develop, um, especially if it's not something that you do every day. Uh, it's, it can be awkward to ask people for, for funds or how, how do I ask without, you know, putting someone out and that was what we were thinking about at the beginning of the pandemic. Like how do we fundraise when so much is happening and so many people are affected. And, you know, what I like to think about is how often we are appealed to in all types of organizations that we support. And even if you are unable to give, that knowing that that's what that organization is up to and, and their goal um, for not only fundraising, but programmatic work is really important. So making the case for what your organization or your market wants to achieve and knowing that the community is there to help you achieve that goal. So I think that just practicing and, and making the ask, the worst is that someone just isn't able to give, but no one, I've learned that no one's offended by the ask. So I'd love to make sure that that message sticks with everybody who's starting out their fundraising campaign. And then again, like I was talking about engaging your partners in media, inviting community support and participation in all forms. So you might be asking for an, you might be appealing for a gift and asking um, folks to support your market or your organization in this time. But there's other things that people can do. One thing that we did at Farm Aid was create a, a list of ways to support family farmers and ranchers every day. And that, that included making a gift to Farm Aid, but it was above and beyond that one simple message. So I would suggest thinking about ways to engage people on social media. Could they do a recipe or photo share of what they got at the market? Um, and, you know, have a centralized hashtag where all of that content is flowing. And that would start the conversation and get people talking about why the farmer's market is so valuable and what that space brings to people outside of just a shopping experience. Um, could you think about an online event? Farm Aid, we held a virtual concert because that is kind of our bread and butter, but there, there might be a way to bring the market virtual. Um, could you do a Facebook live event or an Instagram live, um, cooking and growing demos from some of your vendors? Um, bringing in some of the music that normally plays at the market to be part of your online fundraising events. So, you know, having a little happy hour with, um, with a performer and asking for funds at the beginning and end when you introduce is just an easy way to marry fundraising with um, some sort of fun content. Um, another thing that might be interesting for the farmers market community is that there are so many people that are willing to volunteer and help out and, and to attend the market and to support it, but could they run their own fundraiser? Could you appeal to your list to do something like peer to peer fundraising or a contest? Um, this is, this is a tactic that might be best used by organizations that are 501c3 charitable organizations, but you could use Facebook fundraisers and ask people to for the farmers market week. Um, create their own fundraiser that would support their local market. Um, other fun ways to get people involved that can be easily translated to online are auctions. So um, there's plenty of online auction platforms, and I'd be happy to chat about some that I've used and I know about, um, where you can host an auction, you can ask your vendors to donate an item, the money that you raise at that auction could then, you know, be moved into your um, programmatic work and to support the market during this time. And then one 
addition that I thought is pretty timely is advocacy. So in addition to talking about why you're fundraising and what that money will do for the market, you could think about adding in a piece um, like Ben just talked about, which was an action, a call to action to um, make sure that this information and these strategies that support farmers markets are in, in the next COVID relief package um, to call on your senators and legislators to support family farmers during this time. So there's not just the simple ask for funds, but there's a way to further engage and, and to, to get some interesting community experience out of a time like this. And I wanna let Nora jump in now to talk about the Texas farmers market experience with online fundraising, and then we'll wrap it up with uh, some other campaign information. Great. Thanks so much, Caroline. Um, so uh, like I said, my name is Nora Shabonik and I'm the Deputy Director at Texas Farmers Markets. Uh, we run uh, two markets in Austin. Um, we are some of the largest markets uh, in the country. We have over 100 vendors at each of our markets. And so like I'm sure everyone on this call, when um, COVID started to show its impact in mid-March, um, our markets went from 100 vendors a week to 35 to 40. Um, and we are a nonprofit. Um, we're a 501c4. And uh, we have always received um, all of our operating budget from booth fees, um, or we've gotten um, some uh, federal funding. Um, and we've had a few sponsors, but really the majority of our operating budget comes from our booth fees. And we were seeing a 60% um, decrease in our operating uh, revenue uh, when all of this started. And um, as I'm sure many of you experienced as well, uh, we not only had all of our regular costs, but we had higher costs because of COVID to keep our markets uh, operating. Um, the, with the size of our markets, we had a lot of conversations around how we might be able to pivot during the pandemic while still serving our farmers and ranchers and vendors. And we really found that um, there was no way for us to switch to any sort of like online or pre-order pickup model. And we really had to keep our markets running um, in a similar but different fashion to how they were prior to the pandemic. Um, so we uh, came up with many different things to, to do that. Um, and we also right away uh, realized that we needed to find another um, supplemental source of funding to keep our markets running. Um, so we developed um, a campaign of needing to raise $30,000 um, by the end of July uh, 31st. So we're almost at the end of our campaign. Um, and uh, this was something that uh, we, we kicked off um, the campaign at the beginning of May to run it for three months. Uh, $10,000 a month seemed um, like a stretch for us, but it seemed doable. Um, like I said, we've never fundraised like this before and asked the general public. And so we um, came at this from a space where we didn't have any sort of funding base uh, or funders base. Um, most people uh, in Austin, I think probably many people on this call can attest to this from their own uh, markets. They attend the markets and they love them, but they don't even necessarily know that they're run by an entity, let alone a nonprofit. And so part of um, kicking off this fundraiser was not only um, doing an ask, but also familiarizing people with the fact that we're an entity that needs um, a budget to be able to run these markets. Um, we decided to set our fundraiser up through the platform Square, uh, not through GoFundMe. Um, it was, Square is a free system. We already had an online store that we um, sell some merch for our markets for. Um, and it also enabled us with some key things. So we were able to um, every week draw down funds from this. So we didn't have to like a Kickstarter or a GoFundMe, we didn't have to wait um, for certain time periods to be able to release the funds. It could really be um, every single week we could deposit um, funding from this fundraiser into our bank account. Um, and on average, we were raising about 1500 a week. So it was a really much needed infusion of cash that could start um, right away from the beginning of our fundraiser. Um, but because we didn't use a um, platform 
uh, like a Kickstarter GoFundMe, GoFundMe um, there were some additional challenges like uh, this graphic that we have in here. Um, I, uh, I updated it every week. So it's not something like every time someone donated, then the graphic would automatically update. So there's some pros and cons choosing different platforms. Um, I'm happy to answer further questions about using Square. People have that at the end. Um, and then um, to give you all an example, uh, this picture here is what our um, donation page looks like. And when we um, came up with these different figures, we felt it was really important to showcase showcase the approximate costs of uh, things that we were incurring during this time um, so that people could feel that, oh, not only if they donated $60, it was good for the market, but that actually they were paying for one week of hand sanitizer because at our markets we have, um, during this time we're seeing uh, a decrease in customers, but we're seeing about 2,500 customers come through each of our markets and every single person when they enter gets their hand sanitized. So who's paying for that? Um, so we have, we've been able to have shoppers who can very specifically say, I want to donate to help um, this specific thing that is an additional cost that the farmer's market um, has had to incur. Um, so for us, like I said, because we didn't have any sort of donor base, um, this was really a very pointed marketing campaign. Um, so I'm going to go through um, a number of different tactics that we use um, throughout the course of our three month campaign to help us uh, raise, raise these funds. Um, and um, I'll be really clear from the get go that this was a marathon. Um, it was something where every single week we were doing something different. Um, or trying something new or reaching out to new people. I think a lot of times when people are new to fundraising, they think like, I'll put up this GoFundMe page, I'll send it out on social media, and okay, we raised a few thousand dollars and we'll just let it live here. Um, but for us, this was a very targeted campaign where we did a number of different things throughout our three, three month plan. Um, so uh, first of all, um, uh, let's see, next slide, Caroline. Um, we, uh, we started out um, with how most people would engage with a fundraiser, which we um, did a general call out in our newsletter and on social media. And we had um, an at market sign, a physical sign that was this lemonade jug that our team, you know, as the funds increased, it increased with a yellow highlighter. Um, but we um, we decided to do a lemonade jug. We had a lot of conversations around what um, imagery we should use because um, a lot of things that we initially thought of were like for fundraisers, like I remember from high school, there being like a thermometer. We were like, we don't want to use that. That's not positive right now. Or talking a lot about how to get this message out, you know, saying things like help our message go viral. Don't want to do that now either. So it's really important to think about the messaging that you're using, even just from the get go. Um, so uh, we just decided to do a lemonade jug. It felt really focused around community and something that is, uh, we have a great lemonade at the farmer's market. It felt really positive. Um, and it was something that we could track every week in this jug. Um, our initial response um, through just asking in our newsletter and on social media um, was really great. We had a really positive first infusion of cash in those first couple of weeks. Um, and then it began to lag. Um, so we asked people, not just in social media to donate, but we also asked them to um, share and spread the word. So even if they donated or they couldn't donate, um, to help share this around social media to reach um, farther networks. And we also asked every um, member of our board, we have a pretty small board, um, to, to share this as well. So really trying to engage um, our first circle of people to share the message of our lemonade jug. Um, next slide. Um, we also um, decided that uh, while our markets have always been really based, um, focused on our markets, um, and we've only ever, for the most part, done at market events, we'll sometimes partner with people prior to COVID here and there, um, that we needed to think of a new way to, um, to engage people, and everyone was doing that virtually. And um, I'm sure that everyone on this call also has spent a lot of time um, over the years um, trying to get shoppers to talk to their farmers. And we recognized that during the pandemic, that was the thing that we were telling everyone to stop doing at the market, like get in, get your groceries and get out. And we still wanted to have some sort of conversation and provide a space with our 
um, with our um, farmers and ranchers at the markets to, to have some, some level of connection to um, their shoppers during this time. So um, we uh, set up uh, a half dozen Instagram live tours um, with our farmers. Um, and what we asked was that in the beginning and at the end of these half an hour long tours, um, we just did a little pitch to um, the people who are watching saying, hey, we're bringing this tour, it's totally free, it's educational, but also think about if you enjoy this tour, send five or $10 our way. Um, it was also another thing that we could use um, in trying to uh, reach out to the local media. This was a very specific thing that we could tell the media that we were doing. Um, you know, running farmers markets and staying open to the pandemic, that was something that people were interested in learning about, you know, the first month, second month, but you know, three, four months into this, the conversation is like, yes, you're open and, and so this was a good way to engage with people saying, hey, we're doing this programming. Um, and then it was left up, or it stays on our Instagram um, live channel after the fact, so more people could watch it. We've had about 1,500 people on average watch each of the tours. So it's been, it's been really successful. Um, then, uh, next slide. Um, we also worked on um, really trying to think about uh, how can we amplify our message in the networks of people that are in our network. So um, on the left of this slide, you'll see um, a blog post that I wrote for, um, there's an organic farm in Texas called Johnson's Backyard Garden, and it's really popular, has a large reach, and has a really successful CSA program. And so um, I uh, wrote a guest post for them. Um, just talking about what it takes to continue to run the markets during this pandemic. Um, and it was a great way for shoppers who um, go to this stall, um, but who maybe don't think of the market as an entity. They just, they had allegiance to this farm and they go, oh wait, there's actually an entity that runs the markets that enables this farmer to come here um, you know, once or twice a week. So it was a great way to kind of then expand the circle of our network and reach a new group of people who may have been farmers market fans but didn't necessarily know it um, and it was a great way to like really directly share our message um, then on the right here you'll see that um, we reached out to a lot of local media um, in austin um, and you know the i would say the first month and a half of the campaign um, we really weren't getting um anybody biting and i kind of i will admit that halfway through i was like no one's picking this up. Like, I don't know how this fundraiser is going to do. Definitely everybody has moments uh, in their work um, when that happens. And um, I say this because we didn't get any traction on the fundraiser the first month and a half in the local uh, media. And then starting like mid-June through mid-July, we had a lot of press that came and talked to us. We had print, we had television, we had um, online, and each one of those things gave us a bump. Whenever we could get a partner to share something out, we would get a bump between $500 and $1,500. So really, um, you know, I say this because the local media is great, but also know that like, just because they don't respond right away doesn't necessarily mean that they're not gonna respond if you have a more targeted long-term um, campaign like this. Um, then the next slide. Um, another thing that uh, we are um, lucky to have in our markets, and I imagine a lot of other people on this call have as well, is that there are a number of Instagram influencers who come to our markets, um, who uh, we know that they come because they share um, posts from uh, attending our markets and shopping. And so uh, I reached out to um, many influencers that had seemed to be friends of the market in the past. Um, I wasn't reaching out to new networks of people that weren't connected to our markets, but more people who had come and shared a picture in the last few years. Um, and I found them to be incredibly receptive. Um, I highly recommend that if you do this, send people a direct message, don't email them because the emails that I sent, nobody ever responded, but when I would um, DM an influencer, they would usually respond within like five minutes. Um, and it's a, you know, uh, there's a no risk in asking someone and there's a huge reward. Um, Yoga with Adrian shared our post, that's the example here on the left. Um, and she has hundreds of thousands of followers all around the world. And it was nice to see that too, that not only do we get some donations, but it was also just, a nice thing for people to sh comment and share saying how much they liked their farmers market. So it's a positive thing in that realm as well that helps with, you know, messaging and reminding people that, you know, farmers markets are a, a wonderful thing that we should all be supporting. Um, 
And then uh, the last tactic that we used is one of our vendors, um, Teddy V Cookies, came to us saying that they wanted to um, donate cookies to our farmer's market to sell um, and to help support our fundraiser. And um, I was like, well, that doesn't, that's not really in our wheelhouse because we don't have the permitting. It doesn't really make sense for us to sell cookies. But what if um, instead what we did is this weekend, um, anybody who donates $10 or more will get a free um, pack of cookies. And people responded to that really well. We made like four times as much money from selling, uh, from asking for this uh, donation as a gift, as opposed to us selling the cookies. So if you can think about people in your network who, um, you know, might, might not have any money to give, but, you know, might want to donate some product, um, there's ways that you can kind of creatively think about how to utilize those resources. So it's not just someone um, donating cash, but you can, um, you know, kind of spin it in a new direction to, to find um, ways to increase your fundraising uh, capacity. Um, and uh, I think, this is, do I have one more slide? Is that my last slide? Ah, this is my last slide. So this is where we're at today. Um, we're really close. It's uh, our last week. Um, you can see we're just a few thousand dollars off, um, which, you know, honestly for us is incredibly successful considering we didn't have any donors prior to May 1st. Um, so it really, um, for our team, it, it feels great. We hope that we'll get to 30,000. If we don't, not the end of the world. Um, you know, something that we really worried about um, with this campaign was that people would have giving fatigue from so many organizations asking, um, but you know, we didn't see that uh, because people have been donating throughout. And we've also, you know, we've had, you know, we've had a few larger donations of 250, 500, but really the majority of the donations are coming in small amounts. They're coming in 10, 25, $35, which just shows that like, there's a huge network of people who maybe don't have a lot to give, but they want to support the markets. Um, and uh, they, they have shown up for us. So um, we're, we're really um, heartened by this and, um, yeah, I'm happy to ask any, answer any questions at the end about our experience directly doing this. Awesome, thanks, Nora. Um, you bring up a great point that is something I, I should have pointed out at the beginning too, that Farm Aid also is buoyed by a lot of small donations from all over the country and even internationally. And our average gift, you know, we have these big artists that perform and are able to spread our message, but our average gift is just, you know, $50, $75 from, from regular folks. And so don't be looking for that big golden egg because a lot of those small donations truly add up and can make a huge difference. Um, so before we move to the q and I just wanna talk about some fundraising tools and tips to think about as you plan out your campaign. One is what your market, understanding what your market's tax exempt status is. So I know Texas Farmers Market, they're a 501c4. Farm Aid is a 501c3. As a 501c3, we can offer tax deductible um, donation receipts to folks that donate to Farm Aid. And that's sometimes an incentive to give, or if you have a, a corporate supporter, sponsor, um, or if someone that's gonna match donations, often that tax deductible uh, piece is really, you know, it's a nice incentive for them. So I would consider if you as your market, um, or if you have a fiscal sponsor, might be able to offer receipts for each donation. Um, even if you can't, uh, I know uh, the 501c4s can't offer the tax deductible receipt themselves, it's still really important to offer that acknowledgement as soon as you get the donation, um, whether you do that weekly or, or however you do it, it's, I think it's really important to acknowledge who's contributing to your campaign, whether or not it's tax deductible. Um, and sending that thank you and those updates like Nora's, um, Nora and the Texas Farmers Market did so beautifully. Um, I know Nora talked about Square and I think it would be great for her to elaborate on that if, uh, if folk, folks have questions about how she used Square. But there's other ways to collect donations. Um, if you are a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, you can run a Facebook fundraiser and pair that with your live event, pair that with a page, um, have it linked directly to your farmer's market page if you use Facebook or Instagram for those purposes. So I would definitely look into that as a free, easy to use tool for, non for nonprofits. There's also plenty of nonprofits that are, um, sorry, plenty of platforms that cater to nonprofit organizations that are free. Um, often there is a processing fee. So I did include this little graphic to show kind of what the take would be for the platform if you choose to use a free 
um, donation collection platform. But a lot of these platforms are great because they include an email feature, they include automatic receding, they include text to donate options. If you're gonna run like a, co a concert and you want an easy way for a performer to say, hey, text farmer to this number. Um, sometimes they even have an auction module where you can run your auction or a raffle or a peer to peer fundraiser. I know Facebook fundraisers is a great, it's a great place to engage um, your community to run a fundraising page on your behalf. So, you know, for Farmers Market Week, you might ask your group, your constituents to run their own fundraiser and maybe get a pack of cookies or some sort of reward. Um, but other platforms do offer a sophisticated peer to peer uh, module that you could take advantage of. Um, Donation add-ons, if you have an online market and you're set up to collect um, revenue for the sale of goods online, you can just add on a product that's called a donation. We do that in our Farm Made merch store. Um, so people can choose the quantity of that product and make a gift on top of their order. So you could think about something like that for an easy um, end of purchase donation opportunity. And then GoFundMe, I know Nora talked about why they didn't choose it. Choosing GoFundMe has its own nest of, of considerations that you should explore, but it is a chance to do some stepwise um, rewards and incentives to people as they donate or as they choose a giving level. If you are a nonprofit, there is something called GoFundMe Charity, which sets up these checkout pages and donation opportunities um, that you can manage from the back end. So those are just a few little ideas. Um, I'm happy to elaborate more or, or talk um, about any of these in the Q&A. And I think um, we actually have the only a other thing um, to get a sense oh, sure. of our audience's uh, tax exempt status. I don't know if you wanted to do that really quickly and just so we can see a lay of the land. Yeah. For who's on the call. Okay. Sure. Um, so everyone who's on, com on the computer should see a poll pop up right about now to tell us your tax exempt status. Awesome. So it looks like mostly 501c3s, a few c4s, and other nonprofit designations as well. That's great. I think that this is really interesting then because as you acknowledge and thank your donors, providing that tax deductible receipt is definitely something you are required to do for certain gift levels. So just making sure if this is your first fundraiser that you're considering all of those legal implications of collecting donations. Um, and to entice maybe sponsors or, or others. Wow, okay, great. So pretty overwhelming majority of 501c3. Um, so Nora did some great examples of how they shouted out the donors that came through their campaign and provided campaign progress updates. Um, but one thing to do at the end of your campaign when this runs, and you know maybe you're gonna run it for a week or a month, um, or ongoing is to analyze the results for future fundraising. So thinking about what worked well, what was a tactic that we didn't try that we'd like to try in the future? Um, what seasons can we kind of think about to make thematic sense for our campaigns? You know, harvest time is a good one as your market may be winding down for the season, thanking a farmer, um, Giving Tuesday, Thanksgiving, the holiday time, people are primed to get fundraising appeals at that time and it would be a really great you know, way to continue your efforts through the end of the year. Um, and then thinking about the spring, sowing seeds, getting ready for 2021, hopefully we'll all be back together in person. Um, so kind of laying the groundwork for a great market open um, in the spring if you're not a year round market. But um, just keeping your, you know, it, fundraising is not just a, a, like Lily and Neil and John Nolan can't figure it out. It's not just a one day thing. You can't just have one fundraiser and, and solve your problems. And even if you do, that's great, but you know, you'll know you need funds moving forward. And so considering how you might build on your fundraising campaign in the future is something that's really important. So I think now we can take some questions. Wonderful. Well, let's start with the questions in the Q and A. Um, I believe the top couple are for you, Caroline. Um, Mandy asked, "Where does the 10% decrease in charitable giving projection come from? Does it include event ticket revenue?" 
Okay, that's a great question, Mandy. So this 10% decrease that we were seeing as an initial projection was just sector wide for nonprofits and um, a, an overall general decrease in charitable giving. So that would technically exclude ticket revenue. Um, it's just non, it, it's um, tax deductible donations they were expecting to fall off as the pandemic kind of sped up. And related to uh, the 500,000, that was gross revenue. Um, we collected donations and corporate support through checks and online gifts. And so that was, um, that was what we took from that 24 hour period. Wonderful. Nora, I think these are for you. Yeah, the next question is from Lori for Nora. Um, what is the typical weekly attendance of the Texas farmers market? Would you be willing to let us use this cool graphic with our logo, of course, to save us time and money to start a fundraiser? Um, yeah, so our markets on average, we would see about 5,000 shoppers come through per market. Um, and post pandemic, we're now seeing between 1,500 and 2,500 come through. So less than 50%, but we also, um, uh, do a pretty in-depth estimated sales count um, of all of our vendors that come through. And what we have seen, which we've been really heartened, is that stale, sales have stayed really steady or they've gone up for a lot of our vendors. So even though we're seeing a decrease uh, in customers, we're able to really relate to our vendors that um, it's still very worthwhile for, um, for them to come to the market and sell there. And especially, I'm sure many of you have experienced this too, our farmers and ranchers during the beginning of the pandemic were all being sold out like within an hour or two of the market, but we're not at, at, in that um, buying spree any longer. Um, and then in terms of the graphic, I would be happy to share it. Um, it's uh, an illustrator file, so it does have a little bit of, um, you have to have some expensive equipment to be able to edit it, but I'd be happy to um, share it out to let others use it, not a problem. Thanks, Nora. Um, and I'm wondering if there are any other ideas for ways to create um, an easy graphic like that. One thing that comes to mind for me is Canva, um, which is a free platform that makes it really easy to do some quick graphic design. Uh, so that might be a way to also work around the expensive illustrator. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, Canva is great. Canva is a great thing for people who want to get started. I will also say too, um, like, our team is really lucky because my background is in design, um, but we've definitely had people reach out who have been interested in doing design work. Obviously, um, working with volunteers takes on a whole host of other things, but a lot of people are at home with extra time right now. Um, so you might um, even also just think about putting that out as an ask of saying, we're running this fundraiser. If you can't donate funds, but you're a designer and you have a couple of hours to spare, would you be willing to create a graphic for us? Really great idea. Also for Nora, uh, who shot those Instagram live tours with your farmers from Mandy? Me, me. I did them. <laughs> um, we, I actually uh, went out with um, our executive director. And so we've um, found that um, the tours, we, I, I was the camera woman. Um, uh, and then our executive director, Nena, was on camera with the farmer and um, just to, if you're thinking about doing something like this, just to give you like a really quick rundown, um, what we would do is um, I coordinated with the farmers ahead of time. So we had a schedule and then we uh, promoted the schedule as saying like on Wednesday at 10 a.m. we're meeting with F-Stop Farm and Thursday, blah, blah. So people knew when to tune in. Um, and then um, we would show up to the farm about half an hour beforehand and kind of do a really simple walkthrough with the farmers. Um, so that they knew what to expect. Like we would say like, okay, we're gonna start at the greenhouse and go here. It wouldn't just be like, we'd show at the farm and then go live. We talked through it. Um, and then um, Nena was on camera with the farmer asking questions that she had prepared, kind of moving the conversation through, um, not just, we, we really wanted to have the tours be more dynamic than just like two people standing in a field answering questions. We really tried to kind of both be informational, but also show people at home, like this is what the farm actually looks like. These are what the animals. And then as um, the camera woman, I also um, fielded questions that people had um, on Instagram Live so that it could feel really interactive as people um, tuned in. Also good thing to note that with Instagram Live, um, you can, um, people can make comments 
and you um, can pin a comment as the person who's filming. So when we started the tours, I would, I would uh, write a comment that was like, this is a fundraiser for the farmer's market, donate via the link in our bio. And then I would pin it onto the, onto the um, uh, video so that anybody who tuned in, they would automatically see that comment. So even though we weren't talking about the fundraiser throughout the video, um, you would still know if you tuned in that it was the fundraiser. Awesome. And just really quickly related, someone asked if you shot it on your phone. Yes, I shot it on my phone. And um, one thing to be aware of, we had a, a technical difficulty issue that maybe I can share with you all if you decide to do this so you won't have the same issue. Um, that uh, we shot our first tour at this wonderful dairy called Pure Luck Farm and Dairy. We got to the end of the tour. And then um, if you want to um, save your video, and post it to your page so that it lives on there indefinitely, you have to do it immediately. And it's very hot in Texas, uh, starting a, like in late April. And we shot this um, in late May. And at the end of the 30 minute tour, my phone overheated and shut down and we weren't able to save it. It was very sad. Um, so then what I did on the following tours is I took my phone out of the case because um, cases retain the heat. And I also kind of like monitored it. And when it got really hot towards um, like our ladder tours in the month, I actually had like a little like ice pack that I would put on my phone. So just when you are live streaming, um, oh, and another thing is that um, I could do a whole thing just on live streaming Instagram tours at farms. Um, but we have a little hotspot that we have at our markets that we use for our um, food access because we need to be able to send um, our snap transactions um, automatically. So I brought that hotspot with me and used it as the, um, the internet connection because like LTE, as I'm sure many of you know, you know, at farms like rarely works. So things to be aware of if you decide to do your own um, Instagram live tours is make sure your phone doesn't overheat, save it automatically and bring a hotspot connection so that um, your tour can actually live stream. Um, but it really is amazing. I mean, we all have live streaming capabilities in our back pockets for free. So I say, use it if you can. Yeah, we're live streaming right now, actually. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so next question from Mandy again is, while we're focused on small gifts as well, we're curious to hear how to engage with more major donors folks who are giving at least $1,000? So that's a great question. Um, you are required by laws of 501c3 to acknowledge and provide a tax receipt for any gift over $250. So it's, it might be interesting to kind of think of that as your base for like a major gift so that you're doing an extra special acknowledgement and thank you to those folks. Um, and you might think about how you can if these major donors want to be named, if they don't want to remain anonymous, how you might be able to feature them in any communications or on your site as a, as a type of, maybe it's a steward or, or some sort of special designation for their gift level. Um, I know that that often does make people feel really good. We often put a slide on the um, video set for Farm Aid at our festival of all of our major donors. And it's, it's a nice you know, boost for them and a thank you. Um, so there's creative ways to shout them, provide a shout out to them. Um, I know that Nora did that for every donor and that's an awesome thing to do too, especially if you're just kind of seeding your, your, donate, your donor pool. Um, but we also sometimes provide uh, premiums. So over a certain gift amount, you might be able to give them some swag or some merch. You could think about what that, what makes sense for you. There are some IRS implications for what the good, the goods that you're giving away must be under a certain level per gift. So look into that, but especially for major donors, that, that level is um, far exceeds what that little, I'm not explaining this well, but I can provide a link that helps you determine where you can, how much value you can give to someone. Um, but that would be a great way to give them a special, you know, t-shirt or, or tote bag or something. Nora, did you have any experience with um, soliciting major donations at all? or mostly small donations? We did not have any thousand dollar donors. <laughs> we're all really, we're, ours were all small. The largest ones that we had were um, 500 through the website, um, but we just gave them the shout out and sent a thank you note or email. Yeah. Um, 
one other interesting thing you might be able to do is if, if you know of someone who wants to make a sizable gift, you could ask them if you could use their gift as a match incentive. So if you say, you know, for the next 48 hours, all donations up to $1,000 are going to be matched by the generous folks at X or this family or whomever, um, because that can entice more gifts and that, that almost doubles their impact too. Um, so it's a good way to think if you know of a major donor who really wants to support your campaign to see if you can work in some sort of marketing with them too. It also works for businesses um, as sponsors, you know, match sponsors. Great, thank you. Um, so Nancy asks, uh, some platforms give you a choice of paying a set fee or doing it free where the donors are asked to donate something extra to cover the costs of the platform. How does one make the decision which way to go? Yes, so um, I know exactly what you're talking about. We use a platform called Classy, which I do highly recommend. It is um, fairly expensive. We pay a subscription fee per year, um, but we can ask the donor to cover their processing fee. Um, and that's, I think, what you're talking about. So instead of, you might have the free platform, but you can pass the cost of the processing fee of that donation onto the donor. Typically, that's a checkbox and they opt in to do that. Um, shockingly or not, I mean, I think that every organization is different. We didn't know what to expect when we turned that on to to offer the option. And I would say the vast majority of donors to Farm Aid do select to cover the fee so that 100% of the donation does go to Farm Aid. So um, especially if it is an opt-in, there's no harm in asking. I think that the free plat, if you're running a single campaign and you're not fundraising year round yet, I would think that you should try to go for the free option and then cover the cost or at least budget from your campaign um, take what's gonna cover the, the processing fee. Wonderful, thank you. So we're getting close to 2.30. Um, I don't know if Caroline and Nora, you're able to stay on maybe a few more minutes. We have a, a lot more questions, but if not, we can also uh, send an email with some answers to some of these questions. Are you guys I'm able? happy to? Yeah, I'm able to stay. Awesome. Yeah, I have five, 10 more minutes. I can answer some questions. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna really quick, I'm gonna jump to for Nora, what was the largest lesson that you learned from your fundraising campaign? Um, you know, I would say probably the largest lesson is uh, that, like I said, that this was a, a marathon, like not necessarily a sprint. Like it definitely um, was something where, you know, halfway through this campaign, we had to come up with new ideas of how to market it um, because, you know, the initial of like, like reaching out to the media and, um, you know, spreading through social media, that sort of thing was kind of like our initial development. And then after, you know, we reached halfway to our goal, but we were seeing, you know, donations kind of tick down. Um, it was just like, all right, what's a new idea that we can come up with for this week? So um, I just, I think the big thing with this is to just like, for me was to just like recognize that it wasn't you know, I knew that it was a marketing campaign going into it, but really thinking about it, like each week, how do we try to come up with something new and, and, um, and, and think about it from a different angle. Um, and uh, it worked. Yeah, I think that that's actually probably the most important um, thing to remember because it's so easy to just do one push and hope that it keeps working, but you have to keep at it to remind people. And that's, that's the case with a lot of marketing and, you know, the Facebook algorithm and most um, social media algorithms kind of forces you to do the same. Um, another good question from Margie Stelzer is um, whether we have any tips for, oops, I lost it, how to do this effectively for small markets run by volunteers or with very limited market manager hours. Um, I mean, I, I can give a, a I, well, I'm in a different position, obviously, because we're such larger markets. Um, but, you know, if you if it's run by volunteers or, you know, one person that doesn't have a lot of time, what I would say to do is um, devote 
a few hours to like one planning session where you really try to think strategically of like, okay, how much time does, you know, my volunteer or does this person have, is it an hour? Okay, these are the different ideas I have. You know, this week I'm gonna devote one hour to this. So try to utilize your time as effectively as possible by making um, a, a, a plan ahead of time as opposed to just, um, uh, you know, trying to do all these things. Because obviously doing all the things that I did isn't feasible for someone who is, you know, working part-time doing this. Yeah, I think that Nora, your answer is really important. I, Farm Aid has fundraising staff, so we, you know, we can't really relate to the all volunteer effort, but we do rely heavily on volunteers for um, our annual festival. We engage folks, I think over 400 people um, each year. And so you, there are a lot of hidden skills in the volunteer pool that you might not be realizing. Maybe somebody had a career in nonprofit fundraising or something similar. And I think that tapping the strengths of your community, you might um, be able to meet your need that way. Yes, and I'll also recommend um, leaning on FMC's resources, our templates that we already have, and using those um, to, to do a bulk of the work of the marketing and messaging. Um, I also would highly recommend thinking about, if you are 501c3, using tools that are free like um, Facebook fundraisers, where it's pretty easy to set up, to track, to even how it even has the like the temperature gauge of how close you are to your goal, and really engaging also your vendors and your customers that are loyal to your market to set up their own campaigns. I think that that's just a really helpful way to uh, extend your reach pretty easily and just send out the messaging to your supporters so they can all be using the same messaging, even the same imagery if you have graphics or if you have like a logo that you wanna use so that it still looks like one campaign, but you're having, you're tapping other people to really spread the word and get, get it out there. Oops. Okay, um, let's see. I'll probably have about five, two to five more minutes. Um, let's go with how are you tracking donors and is there a lot of staff time spent sending thank yous? I can quickly talk about um, how far my does that. So we use a donation platform called Classy, which this is going to answer two questions, I think, because it flows to Salesforce. So we are using Salesforce for nonprofits. Um, it's an awesome, robust tool. You have to spend a lot of time and typically consulting dollars to make it work exactly the way you need it to. So that's something important to know right off the bat, that it is free, but like anything, there is a lot of... Um, hidden cost if you want to make it super custom. I'd be happy to have a call about both Classy or other, we've used other um, donor management platforms before as well as Salesforce. If anyone wants to do that, I can, my email, I can in make sure is included in that um, email going out to all the participants and I'm happy to talk. I spend a lot of time on um, constituent management and acknowledgements and Kind of fundraising admin stuff so i'd be happy to get more in depth with those who need some guidance um and for us um we don't use uh salesforce we don't have donor management usually so um what we did was um every week um on tuesdays we exported a list from Square of all of the people who donated. And then we uploaded them into our um, newsletter platform. We use Emma. Um, it's like a MailChimp type of thing. And then we sent out um, the same form thank you letter to all of those people via Emma. So um, it was something that it was a streamlined process, but it's something that's much, much, much simpler than using Salesforce. Um, and, uh, you know, wasn't too time consuming for our team to do. It was a pretty um, quick task. So we definitely weren't trying someone donated, send them an email. Um, it, was, it was an automated process that we, we, we automated. Yeah, yes. and, and I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say with Facebook fundraisers too, if that's the route you go, you can export the names of your donors and, and send them a thank you through your own email system at your leisure. 
Awesome. Yeah. Facebook actually sends an automated email to all donors that's through Facebook that will take care of like the legal um, 501c3 language. But I would highly recommend sending something, of course, from your own organization to foster that connection. Um, I was just going to say FMC uses NEON, which is another CRM that does automatic um, thank yous when someone donates. But another um, option is just if you have a board to try and engage your board on writing those handwritten thank yous, because um, if you do want, you know, your donors to come back maybe next year or in the future, it's really important to foster those relationships and make that connection. Uh, so that might be a good way to to limit staff hours, but still um, have that personal touch a little bit. Okay, um, there's only a few questions left. Um, one is asking about templates for acknowledgements and receipts for donations. Um, I don't believe that we have anything on FMC's resource library at the moment, but it is something that you can very easily Google, like the, the mm -hmm. exact language that you need to use um, for a tax exempt letter, but yeah. that is, something that we will consider creating soon um, because I, I can see that being really useful for market operators. Yeah, it is pretty easy to find that language and you can just copy and paste it to the end of your letter. Um, you want to include the gift amount and the gift date and the donor name and address uh, for legal purposes. But then the rest of your thank you and acknowledgement should just be, you know, from the heart, something short, talking about the campaign update and how much their gift, you know, contributed to furthering your mission and your work. Definitely. Okay, well, let's just do the last question. For those who have done auctions, how long do you have your auction run? A nice simple question. <laughs> um, we do auctions quite frequently for Farm Aid. Um, we do memorabilia and experiences for the festival this year. That'll look a little different. Um, we typically have our auctions running for two to four weeks because we're selling ticket packages and things like that in concert with our normal ticket sale. I will say there is an art and science to auctions. Um, you don't want to run them for too short of a period of time because then you you might not drill, drum up enough momentum and bids. But all the bids, the winning bids, tend to come at the very, very end. So you also don't want to drag it out for a very long time either. Um, it kind of it depends on your audience. It depends on whether this is an auction, a silent auction at an event, then it is specifically time bound to that event, or if you can extend it longer than the event and keep marketing it. Um, I would say that you, you'll want to get enough time where people know it's happening and you can send a couple reminders, but you know, sometimes two weeks is just too long and people lose interest and they just don't come back to bid. So I would say you play around. It's nice to start with silent auctions that are tied to an event so you can kind of say, okay, the auction is open from six to nine and then we're gonna process the winning bids um, and then kind of move to the online auction. But it, auctions are a great way to raise funds because you can get a lot of really cool, interesting, especially from vendors, um, donations if, if they're willing and make it feel like something that's representative of your market. Great, thank you, Caroline. All right, well, I, I think we're gonna have to wrap up for now, but we will be reviewing all of the comments in the chat and we'll compile all the questions and answers. Um, if anything wasn't answered into the email that we sent out with the recording of this webinar. I wanna thank everyone for coming. Thank you so much to Caroline and to Nora for sharing your expertise and your experience um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful National Farmers Market Week and participates as much as you can. Um, if you do have, if you do end up setting up any events, fundraisers, be sure to tag FMC in those, and we'll help to share it uh, and spread the word during National Farmers Market Week. Thanks everyone for coming. Have a Thank good you. rest of your day. <laughs>